Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Mm, you guys have eaten so much Christmas lunch already? No, I don't think so. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you this morning in church. We pray that you had a wonderful week. We're going to start singing and we want you to join us in our praise and worship this morning. So please be upstanding. We're going to sing the song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Who do we adore? Oh, only Pastor Lloyd adores Jesus. Who do we adore? Jesus. Jesus. And that's what we're singing about this morning. So join in. Are you here to praise God this morning? Yeah. Christmas, yes. I know there's decorations and trees and gifts and stuff, but it's all about Jesus, amen? amen. And if you're in Sabbath school this morning, the songs we sang was about Jesus. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Reach out to Jesus. And that's what the season's about. Jesus is the reason for the season. And sometimes we forget that, um, but we shouldn't. And so we're going to sing the song, Hark the Heralds, Angels Sing. And just like the angels sang, we want to hear you sing this morning. Hark the Herald, Angels Sing.
I was following Pastor Lloyd on Facebook this week. Sorry, Pastor Lloyd's not stalking anything. Are we doing welcome now? Are we doing no? And um, someone had posted an article about, yes, Jesus wasn't born the 25th, and it's a pagan this and pagan that. And Pastor Lloyd said, yes, but what a great opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone Amen. who's never heard it before. And they're reminded about it at this time. And so that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to do, is tell people, yes, Jesus was born, yeah, not 25th, but he was born so that he could save each one of us. And we need to go and tell it wherever we can, every opportunity we can. This song, go tell it in the mountain. Let's enjoy it for what it says. Thank you, singers. That was great. <laughs> Go tell it on the mountain because it's the best news you've heard all year, all your life, in fact. I just wanted to welcome you here today. It's so lovely to see your faces. Welcome to those who are watching us on TV and online. And you know what? New Hope is a very special place. And I have a little story that I want to tell you because God does miracles in this church, doesn't he? Like all along, there's been miracle after miracle. And last week, I had a little miracle and it was this... It was part of this church, and so I want to share it with you. You remember the last week I, I did the preaching, and at the end I sang a little song. Do you remember that? I was pretty nervous. I've never played in front of anyone before. And um, so my teacher always tells me, Claire, your rhythm is so bad. 
Like, you just can't keep in time. You do everything fast. You start off normal. By the end of the song, you're doing like 100 miles an hour. And it's just, just, it makes me just play with drum beats over and over. And I just can't get it. And so I said to Aaron, I said, Aaron, can you please just play bass with me after the first verse so that I can stay in time? And um, I look up after I started singing and Aaron's sitting in the front row and I'm like, oh, no, he's meant to be over there playing the bass. Anyway, so I just went, oh, we got to keep going. So I, I, as you know, I kept playing. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, I can hear him playing. He must have the bass in the front row. So afterwards, he came up to me and he said, oh, you stayed in time. Fine. I said, oh, thank you. Did you have your bass in the front row? And he said, no, I didn't have my bass. I said, but I could hear you playing the bass. I could hear the bass. What do you mean? He said, no, I wasn't playing the bass. So I don't know if there was an angel playing bass or he was just playing bass in my head, but I could hear him playing last week. And I think that's pretty amazing, you know? And God does amazing things, even the little things that we think maybe aren't so important. He knows when they're important. He comes through when he needs to. So God is a good God and God is here with us today. So welcome. We want to welcome you to a church where the Holy Spirit is. So thank you for coming today. It's come time for our prayers. And we have so much to thank God for and so much to ask him for. And I have quite a long list here, so... We would like to ask, you remember um, Imogen asked this a couple of weeks ago. Imogen would like us to pray for her. She's trying to witness to her young friend, Tina. So is Imogen here? No, uh, she's not here today. She's Marie's daughter. So if you guys know who I'm talking about, um, pray for her that she'll be able to, a great witness to her friend. She's only a little girl. So pray for her that she'll have that strength to witness and for all of us to have that, that courage to get out there and witness for our, for our faith. Rosalia Rodriguez, Rosalia's sister in, back in Chile, She's been in and out of hospital over and over again. Her name's Haiti, and she spends about two weeks out of, and then three weeks back in hospital. And it's just a back and forward and backward forward. And Rosalia would like her to have peace and just freedom from constant sickness. So whatever God's will is, we're happy with that, but she just wants her to be free from that constant pain. And, uh, and so we just ask that you be with, that we will pray that she'll understand God's love and that she'll be comforted in her heart. That's for Haiti. Um, Rosalia also has a niece named Maria who's going to have surgery for breast cancer this Tuesday. So if you could pray for Maria, but the Holy Spirit and that, that will touch that physician's hands that he'll do a good job with that surgery. Maddie Parsons went to the Philippines. If you've ever talked to Maddie, you probably would have heard that he went to the Philippines. And um, they did a... Were you guys building a church there and doing Bible work as well? Evangelism. Just evangelism, building the church up there. And it's in a little place called um, Mapanis, which is in North Samar. Did I get it right? In the island of North Samar in the Philippines. And just this week, there's been a cyclone there. And it's been severely damaged. So Maddie would like us to pray for all his friends and all the people that are there because it's close to his heart. The people of Mapanis. Jamie. Jamie would like us to pray for his friend or her friend. I'm not sure who Jamie is. If you're here, I'm sorry. Jamie, put your hand up. Is your Jamie? Okay. Um, she's having hard times. Her friend, the name is Tiram. They had to put their dog down and her cousin died. So that's a tough time. So play, pray for Jamie. No, pray for Tiram. Yeah. And talk to Jamie about it after church. Button is waiting for visas for her mum and dad so they can come to Australia for the holidays. Let's pray they get their visas. Family, you need to be with your family on the holidays. There's no good being on your own by Christmas. So we pray for that. Pray for Conrad. He's still looking for accommodation. Conrad's at Ali and he works in our, in our local area and he needs a place to stay. So let's pray for him to get some cheap accommodation. Rowinia, um, her sister-in-law just had radiation therapy. She hasn't heard from her since. So we just pray for her that she's recovering well and that the radiation is doing the trick. God will be with them. Cindy and Anthony are waiting on housing so they can be close to church. Let's pray that they can get a house because they live, as you know, Waramu, very far away. So we pray that they can be closer. Uh, you might remember a few weeks ago we were praying for Shamila's dad. He has diabetes and he was having some trouble and he was having trouble walking. Well, she, she came to me before um, between church and Sabbath school and said that she, he's doing much better. Just as of last night, right? She spoke to him and he was finally feeling better and more chirpy and happier. So if we could keep praying for Shamila's dad. He's not out of the woods yet. But thank you for your prayers, and we want to thank God for what he has done in Shamila's dad's life. Jackie um, came up to me, and she shared with me that she just got redundancy from her job, which she was happy about. She wanted the redundancy, but God actually got a new job for her right straight away. 
Like she'd prayed about it and it was the perfect place, closer to home, good money, everything she could have wanted and there was not even a gap between the two jobs. She wanted to praise God for the little things. That's a big thing in our lives. And God can come through in all areas of our lives. So I thank you for that and thank God for that. Now, Christine, I, I should really get her up here, but she doesn't want to. She should write it out for me. Christine's brother. Do you remember like, it was about a month ago now that they went across to America, right? You've been back for a month. But we were praying for Christine's brother a little while ago that he had cancer and that he was in really big trouble. And we were praying for him and Christine and Rachel went over to America specifically because of that. And they went over there expecting possibly to be attending a funeral. And Christine's brother doesn't, he's not a, a believer, like he's not a Christian. But she had told him that we were all praying for him here at New Hope. And when she went over there, they found out that the doctor, because he had had cancer 10 months before, then it returned and it was in his lymph, in his stomach. And the doctors were like, it's not responding to the, the, the treatment we're doing. His blood cell count isn't coming up. And he's within four hours of septic shock. Like they were expecting him to die. And then all of a sudden, he just made a turnaround. And now he's, he's almost to the point where he's in the clear. They're going to give him the, a full bill of, of health in January this year, coming year, if he's okay. Like God has done him, and he said, I am a walking miracle. He knows, he said that those prayers must have worked. God is really good, right? He hears those prayers and he answers them. So we want to thank God for what he's done in this life of Christine and their family. And we keep praying, yeah, that, that he will be completely, completely clear. And that most importantly, he'll come to know Jesus as a result of knowing that he's the one who healed him. We can praise God for being a big God, can't we? All right, it's come time to actually pray now. So as we always do, I'll give you some time and I'll finish at the end. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your Holy Spirit into this place. Thank you that you work miracles in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones. And thank you that you are answering our prayers. Thank you that you are an eager God who can't wait to answer our prayers and you, you love to have us speak with you. Father, I ask this morning that you will be upon each person that's sitting here. May your Holy Spirit fall May it be in their hearts, baptizing them and clearing out the distractions and the doubts and opening each of our minds so that we can hear you speak. Father, we want to thank you for the healing that you did in Christine's family. We want to thank you for all the things in advance that you, we haven't seen yet, but you promised to do. Father, we want to ask that you'll be with those who can't make it here today, that are that are struggling with um, with sin struggling with finances struggling to just make it out of bed father we want to pray that you'll please bring them here back to you we want to pray for those who have visited and and haven't come back we want to pray for those who are watching online and can't make it but are sitting there watching today wishing they were here so father please just help us to remember that you are a god who loves and that you are eager to to save those who come to you Father, just touch our hearts today. Help us to hear you speak and help us to obey. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children down as we sing this children's song. Wide, wide as the ocean. And we'd like you parents to sing along as well. Children will have the instruments in front so they cannot do the actions. 
So when you upstanding, we'd like you to do the actions for us. And it's nice for kids to see mom and dad participating. I'm in the wrong place. So little ones, come on down, get yourself an instrument. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Jomo, get your instrument. I'd still more kids coming down. Come and get your instrument. Is everyone being served, so to speak? All right, let's be upstanding. As we sing the song, we're going to do it twice, and we're going to see you do the actions. Wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deep sea, He's my Savior's love. truth about God's love. Amen. It reaches us everywhere. Amen. Thank you, children. Yes. Offering. Those kids sound good, don't they? And you sounded good too. Were you all doing, the, were they all doing the actions? Not all of them, Pastor. Not all of them. Oh, I'll tell you after. I think um, um, that one of the great privileges we have is to give to the Lord. Now, we are a miracle church, and I've been talking to the Lord at length the last couple of weeks, actually, and I have a sense that God will take us to our own building. Hallelujah. And I'm not sure how He will do it. We thought we might have had one last week. There was a, a Tongan church that went broke, not an Adventist one, that sat over a thousand people in it. That would be perfect for us, hallelujah, because that's where God's taken our church. Um, but it fell through. But one thing I know is that He's going to take us there. Uh, it'll be a miracle. It'll be a great miracle, but we're going to watch Him do it. And I think the reason He's going to give us a church, whether we build it or whether He gives us one, is because he wants us to go tell it on the mountain. That's why he has set this church up. 
The music and the worship is beautiful here. The fellowship is just wonderful. But God wants us to go tell it on the mountain. And our offerings, they go toward not just keeping this place open, but eventually us finding our own church, our own building, and working from there. And I'll tell you what, when we have our own building, won't it make a difference to our mission? Amen? So it's come time for the offering. I want to thank you for your faithfulness this year. I, I, can I give some figures, Brother Treasurer? Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this year God has blessed us to the extent that we have how much in the television account now? 71,000? Can you say amen to that? Amen. And I think over 40,000 in our general, uh, whatever you call it, our budget, our, our local budget. And that's come about through the faithfulness of you people. Now, I don't say that for you to say, oh, we, we don't have to give anymore. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. Uh, I, I think we, we're looking at some five to ten million for a building in this awfully expensive city of ours and so God is calling us to be faithful and if we are faithful to him in worship with our giving what does he do he makes up the what he more than makes up the difference and I'm pretty sure that God is going to give a lot more to where we're going than we do amen I, I know it I know it but I do thank God and I give you those figures I do thank God because he has been so so wonderful in blessing us with you who've responded to him so generously this year in your offerings. So let's pray and ask the Lord to take this act of worship, our offerings, and take them and bless them and do what he's already been doing, multiply them so we can continue to do his work out here in the northwest of Sydney. Dear Father, it's a privilege for us to be able to give to you. We only give back a little bit of what you give to us. But we give it back, God, from hearts that are overflowing with love for you. And we do it because, well, it's a free will thing. And we do it because we worship and we serve you. So take this offering. As we've said, God, multiply it in big ways because we have great challenges here in this city to establish a worship center and a place of, uh, uh, Lord, that can, the gospel can go out to our community. It's really hard. So take this offering, Lord, multiply it in a big way and make what is hard easy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing this beautiful song, O Come All You Faithful, as we take the offering. And I think toward the end of it, we might even stand up.
one more time. I want to thank the, the tech team and the musicians and the singers this morning for leading us in these beautiful songs. Amen. And I want to welcome you again to church this morning. I don't normally preach from a computer, but this morning I went to print my, my church sermon out and my printer decided to run out of ink. And so here I am with a computer in front of me and God willing that this is all going to go all right. Um, I've entitled, I've titled this presentation Prophecies of Jesus the Messiah or I could uh, perhaps say uh, why the wise men and the shepherds in Bethlehem knew the Messiah was coming and I hope and pray you find this interesting but at the very end of this Bible study, I want to challenge you to do something this Christmas because it's Christmas time. Do you like Christmas time? Well, I don't. <laughs> I love Christmas Day, but Christmas time itself is a very difficult time for me because it's just so busy. Are you finding that? You know, I went to the shops with Danae yesterday and uh, I'd been sent there to, to do a job for Lizka. And we went in there at Hornsby and we drove the car in and it was so clogged and so crowded that I actually ended up being funneled back out of the car park. And I hadn't been able to get it and I almost gave up. And Danae said, no, we'll, we'll find a car park, Dad. In, in we go. And we did go in and uh, talk about a miracle. We found a car park. Uh, but man, it is a busy time, Christmas time. But it, it is a happy time for a lot of people. Families get together. Um, there's times of rejoicing and reunions. I don't know where you are this Christmas, but I want to give you one more invitation before we do our Bible study this morning. If you're alone or you're hanging about and don't have a lot to do Christmas Day, uh, I want to invite you to come and have Christmas lunch with Lizka and me and New Hope. And we're going to have it right here outside those doors in the foyer. Now, what time will we eat, Lizka? That's the most important thing. 12.30 12 we're going to eat. So what time would we be here? I'll be here at 12.30. Okay. Now, if you want to come, though, we need to know. And uh, uh, if you know Lizzie, just wave your hand, Lizzie. So they can turn around so they can see you. Come on, up your stand. Say, look, there could be visitors here. This is Lizka. She's the cook. I'm the servant. <laughs> but if you want to come, it's important that we, if, if you haven't given your name to Lizka yet, now Lizka's going to stand with me at the door after church as you head out to fellowship lunch. Make sure you give your name to Lizka because we need to know uh, how many are coming because it will be a tragedy if more people turned up and we never had enough food. That would be a Christmas tragedy. And we don't want that. Oh, you want people to reconfirm too. Oh. So if you're coming, let Liz can know today, just so she knows for sure. Okay, let's pray and we'll get into this Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us in our worship today in this church. You are beautiful a wonderful God. And today as we talk about how you got down off your throne and came down here to become one of us, I pray, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will be in this room. Thank you, Father, we pray in your name. Amen. 
I don't know whether you realise this, but there are over 350 prophecies about the coming of Jesus in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Is this ringing, Andrew? Are you guys hearing a ringing or is it just me here? A, a ringing in the sound? Can you hear a ringing? It's this thing here, Andrew. You know how you sit under... Let me start again. I don't know whether you know, but there are over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. Now, it amazes me that there could be an atheist anywhere on the entire earth. Because if you open the Bible and you start to read these prophecies that were written hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus came, before Jesus actually got down off the throne and came and became a baby, how can you be an atheist? It's incredible to me. Over 350 prophecies that point forward to Jesus who came as a baby, grew up, became a man and saved the world. Over 350 in the Old Testament. Do you get what I'm saying? Over 350 before he arrived. Do you get that? Three, over 350. It's an amazing number and every single one of them came true. Amazing. Mathematically, mathematically, the probability of this happening and being chance is impossible. 350, and I want to look at five, just five short one-verse prophecies that point forward to Jesus, the Messiah, the one that so many in our world look at, how be it even briefly, at Christmas. And these prophecies are some of the reasons why the wise men and the shepherds knew to look out for the Messiah. Prophecy one, if you have your Bibles, and I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to our church. If you have your Bibles, and I do that because I've said it before and I'll say it again and again and again, I want you to open your Bibles or to be on your phone, looking at your Bibles on your phone, I want you to see the words for yourself. The first prophecy is in Genesis. In fact, this is the first prophecy about Jesus the Messiah, full stop. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let me just give you the context. I think most of you will already know it. The world is pristine, new, brand new, just being created by God. Adam and Eve are in the world, and they get confronted by a choice. And you know the story, how they listened to Lucifer, who was disguised as a serpent, and the world fell. And when the world fell, the moment that Eve ate that fruit, she began to die. She disconnected herself from Jesus, the life giver. There is no life outside of Jesus. She disconnected herself from Jesus, the life giver, and she begins to die. And God makes this prophecy. And it's a prophecy that gave hope to Adam and Eve immediately in their despair. He says, and he's talking to Lucifer, he says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And then here's the prophecy. He's actually saying, I'm going to send someone, someone from the throne of God, and he, Satan, he will strike you on the head and you will strike his heel. He's saying, I'm going to send a Messiah for the planet. And that Messiah, Satan, will hit you on the head. He will knock you out. He's actually saying he will finish you. He will destroy you. Yes, you will strike him on the heel. You will hurt him. You will cause him pain. But he's saying a Messiah is coming. Now I want to ask you a question. How long did it take from the time Adam and Eve, and you better believe it, Adam and Eve began immediately to look for the Messiah. So who's their first son? Cain. Who do you think he might be? The Messiah. And then Abel. And, and so forth, down through the sons. Is this the, and, and you know, every follower of God would look at their son and wonder whether he was the Messiah. How long did they wait? 4,000 years. From the time Jesus made 
God gave that promise. They waited 4,000 years for Jesus to come. Now, I get onto Facebook. One of the things that caused me a lot of pain is I see, and I've shared this with you before, how some of my friends, pastors, even ex-pastors, who they've left the Lord, they've left the church, they've left the ministry, they've shunned God and they become so bitter and they become so angry and they, they thrash God. They thrash him on Facebook and you get onto to Facebook and one of the things they do is they mock us about the promise of Jesus' return. You know, Jesus said, I will come again when he was walking on this earth. Now, for the first Messiah, they waited how many years? 4,000. How long have we been waiting? Well, actually, none of you have been waiting much more over 60 or 70. (laughs) But as a human race, we've been waiting for 2,000. I think there's a little warning in this first prophecy today, and here it is. Don't for a moment think that because we've been preaching the return of Jesus for 2,000 years that it's not going to happen soon. The first time around they waited 4,000 years. We've been waiting half that time and just as Jesus came the first time, you can guarantee he's going to come the second time. And it's on. I'm going to talk about it next week in church. I'm going to talk about the signs. It is on. We will see Jesus, the same Jesus who came the first time as the the Messiah, we will see him come back, and this time to save us and take us home. That's the first prophecy. Let's have a look at at the second one. I like this one. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to look at that and I want want you to ask yourself for a minute, who's coming here? For unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government will rest upon his shoulder. This is the king, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who came down? It was God. Well, yes, it was Jesus. And I hear some people in Adventism say, well, it was the son. It wasn't just the son. It was God. Do do you understand that? It was Yahweh. The king of the kings, the mighty God, the author of life. It was Jesus, God, who got down off his throne and was, he came to earth as a small baby. It was God. It was God who came down here. I was doing a Bible study with a group of young people when I first went to Warunga a few years ago. It was a long time ago, now almost... 20 years ago and uh, they said to me look we've got a friend and he's a great guy he's he's really on fire for the Lord can he come and do a guest Bible study and we had 20 30 young people turning up for Wurunga to my house every Friday night we'd give them a meal and then we'd do the Bible study I said sure bring him along so this guy comes young firebrand preacher Hadn't been to Avondale, but he was a preacher and he's going around sharing his message. And he begins to open the Bible and he shares this message that Jesus is not eternal. That Jesus came forth somewhere in the the eons of eternity. He came forth from the Father, but he was actually saying there was a time Jesus did not exist. And I found out later he was an anti-Trinitarian. And it was quite embarrassing in front of 20 or 30 youth to have to shut this guy down from the scripture with what he was saying. But I don't want you to leave here today with any doubt in your heads. It was not some created or some brought forth being who came down here as a baby on the earth, grew up and died for you. It was God. It was God. God died for you. God lived for you. It was God. Third prophecy. I like this one because I was born in, in Nara, base hospital, at about lunchtime on a Sabbath on September 14. 
I like to think that um, God, Jesus, was born on my birthday. You know, there's a lot of talk about the fact that Jesus was not born at Christmas. Well, the fact is he was not born on December 25. In fact, if we were to get to heaven and he was to tell me or us that he was born on December 25, I'd be very surprised. Because you remember Mary and Joseph had gone from where? To Bethlehem. They'd gone from Nazareth to Bethlehem to be numbered because the, because the, the Roman king had asked for the entire empire to be numbered for tax reasons and they'd gone back to their home village and they only traveled in the european the northern summer that's when they would travel so jesus was born somewhere between when july june july right through to september so i was born in september wouldn't it be great i'd love that if the lord was born on my birthday we will never know and it doesn't really matter but the amazing thing here is you've got Jesus, God giving a promise that Jesus would come. And then God assuring us that when he does come, second prophecy, that it is him, that it is God that is coming. So he promised he would come and then he said, I'm coming. God's coming. And then he says, not only am I coming, but I'm going to tell you where I'm coming to. Now, I was born in Nara. What are the chances of even 50 years before I was born, of someone predicting where I would be born. Well, pretty slim. In fact, almost impossible. And yet you've got Micah here. Thousands of years, not thousands, hundreds of years. You've got Micah hundreds of years before Jesus turns up, prophesying about where he would be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah... Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forths are from of old, from everlasting. What God is saying through the prophet Micah here is, hey, I promised a Messiah. The Messiah is me. And I'm going to be born in Bethlehem. This tiny little village in the region of Ephratah, this tiny little village, is where I choose to come and be born in. Now you're a wise man, or you're a shepherd, and you're in the Scriptures, and you're reading, because they're Scriptures with the Old Testament, and you're reading these things, do you think you're starting to get a look through a window on who the Messiah is and where he's going to come? Do you think so? Huh? Huh? Yeah, you are. So Jesus so far is saying, I'm God. And he says to Adam and Eve, I promise I'm coming. And then the second prophecy, he says, make no mistake, this is not a created being, it's not an angel. It's not someone from somewhere else coming to save you, it's me. I looked down on you, I saw the hurt and I saw the pain. I see what you're going through, I see the death. And God says, I'm coming for you. And he says, so you can know it's me, I'm coming to Bethlehem. Doesn't end there, prophecy 4. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, I love this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him, who? Do you know what Emmanuel means? Yeah, come on, anti-Trinitarians. The very name of the Messiah says what? God is with us, and he is born by a... I like to... Um, I don't know whether you call it play tricks or not. I remember Dylan. Where's Dylan and Leah? They're here somewhere. Where are you guys? Up there somewhere. Oh, I can't see them, but anyway... They're here. Oh, there they are, hiding. I didn't just do it to you guys, I did it to, to others too. But I kind of like to play this trick. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to do it. I'm actually going to show you the trick. Uh, and I, I need... Okay, Aaron, come here. And Paula, come here. Please, please. <laughs> I'm learning to say please since I got married. <laughs> 
let's pretend one day they get married. Amen. Hallelujah. Come right over here where everyone can see in the light. No, you'll be closer than that. <laughs> now, Paula, have we got a microphone here? Yep, green one. I've got to turn it on somewhere here. Okay, you're right. Paula, where are you from? Portugal. You're from Portugal? Yes. Can you uh, say something to us in Portuguese this morning? Something that's nice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, feliz sábado. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Feliz sábado. Is that it? Okay, so you're from Portugal. Yes. Thank you. We're glad to have you here too. We're glad to have this beautiful young woman in our firm family. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, now, Aaron, where are you from? New Zealand. Oh. Can we get another volunteer? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're from New Zealand. Yep. Now, 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 answer the question. We, we look at Paul and we look at Aaron. If they get married one day and they had kids, what would the kid be? Half? Now, you remember when I did this, Dylan, the, the Bible study? You remember, Leah, with you guys? What would the kid be? Half what? Half? New Zealand. And the good part? Half? <laughs> half what? Portuguese. We'd love you Kiwis a lot more if you didn't have such a good rugby team. <laughs> so you'd have a half Kiwi and a half Portuguese. You could almost say third Kiwi, third Portuguese and third Australian. Australian. So you'd have a mixed up kid, wouldn't you, you guys? <laughs> so Jesus comes to earth. Now let me re just stay there for a sec. Let me read the text again because I really like this text. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and we'll call him Emmanuel. Now, 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 let's pretend this is Joseph and this is Mary. And Mary tells Joseph she's pregnant. How does he feel? Look, I, I, do you know that uh, this Friday, Lizka and I have been married for one year. Hallelujah. And it's been a happy year, hasn't it, baby? <laughs> You've got to say yes, haven't you? <laughs> it's actually been a really happy year. It was really important to me, I think to Lizzie too, before we got married, for me to know that she belonged to me and no one else. Amen? Don't you like that about your husband? Don't you like that, Erwin, that this girl... Belongs to you. You're proof that God exists too, aren't you, marrying this beautiful girl, huh? <laughs> it, isn't it nice to know? And don't you like the fact, Lynn, that he belongs solely to you? So how does, how does Joseph feel when he finds out that Mary's pregnant? Betrayed. But an angel comes and tells him the truth. And what was the truth? Look at this. The father of Jesus was... Who actually was it? Is the Holy Spirit God? Is he a person? He's a third person of the Godhead. That doesn't mean he's number three. He's not number three. He's just, we just call him the third person. They are all equal. Three persons. How many gods? One God, like a family. So the Father is the Holy Spirit, but the Mother is human. You, I imagine Mary would look a bit like you too. <laughs> She's human. So does that make Jesus, the baby, half God and half human? My, my brother is married to a Tongan girl. He's Australian. They've got kids, I might have told you, they're amazing kids, aren't they, Lizka? Blonde hair, one of them. Blue eyes and brown tongue and skin. Talk about blessed. <laughs> half tongue and half Australian. Half Kiwi, half Portuguese. If Lizka and I ever have... No, we're not, let's not go down that road. <laughs> That's not happening, girl. <laughs> you know that she wrote a thing on Facebook the other day when we got our new dog and said, what did you say? Some awful thing where everyone thought she was pregnant. And I said, man, I'm 52. <laughs> you really want one, don't you, babe? <laughs> if we did, it would be half Indonesian and half 
Australian. It won't happen, don't worry. I'm just using this as an illustration. I'd have to take long service leave just to get over the shock of that happen. <laughs> Let's go back to Jesus. Is he, and, and, and Leah and Dylan, you're not allowed to answer. Is he half human and half God? What is he? It, it, it's a mystery. But he is fully, totally, completely human, just like you and me. But if he walked into the room, oh, you can sit down, Kiwi boys. <laughs> but if he walked into the room, this is a deal. And this is what, it's so amazing what Jesus did. If he walked into the room now, I wouldn't worry about you guys. And I don't think you'd be worrying about me. Our entire focus would be on Jesus. I would fall on my knees. I would fall flat on my face in worship. Because not only is he fully human, what is he? He is fully, completely, totally God. Emmanuel, God with us. Stop and think about it. He gets off the throne. He, oh, we put God, we put Jesus in this small box. He made the entire universe from one end to the other. This world is less than a speck, but we're on it. And he made us, and he loves us, and he loves you. And he got down off his throne. God, and became a human being, tied to the human, tied to the human race for eternity. Stop and think right now on the throne. Who's sitting on the throne? Who? God? Who? Jesus Christ. He's a human being. A human being sits on the throne of heaven, ruling the universe. Now, if our brother is the king. What are we? I am royalty. It doesn't matter that the new idea is not interested or the Woman's Weekly is not interested in me. They're not going to go and take pictures of me with my shirt off on holidays at the beach. <laughs> or if they do, they'll make sure the magazine doesn't sell, eh, <laughs> Liska? <laughs> I'm royalty, are you? Because the one who came down here and became one of us is God, born of a virgin. His father, physical father, is God. His physical mother is Mary. A tie, an internal tie between divinity and humanity in Jesus Christ. And that's why when the wise man... Bible says when the wise men came into that stable and they saw the baby Jesus, they, what did they do to him? They worshipped him. The shepherds worshipped him. The disciples worshipped him. Today in this church we worship him. And the last prophecy, well I'm going to use a whole heap of text here, we're going to run through them really fast. Watch this. Jesus is the saviour of the world. His life, his birth, his life, his death, prophesied, prophesied so intimately in the Old Testament, you can't miss it. Watch this. Number one, he would be betrayed. This is the prophecies in the Bible. I'm just picking a couple really fast out for you. Number one, he would be betrayed. He would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41, verse nine. That prophecy was a thousand years old when Jesus came. Was he betrayed by a friend? Number two, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 11, 12, and 13. <coughs> Number two, the Bible says in Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That prophecy was written 500 years before Jesus came. Was he betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Number three, he would be spat upon and beaten up. Isaiah 50, verse 6, that prophecy was written 700 years before he came. Was he spat upon and beaten up? Number four, he would be silent 
before his accusers, Isaiah 53, 7, written 700 years before he came. Was Jesus in his judgment in the court of Pilate silent before his accusers? There's a, there's, a, there's a really strong case building here. Number five, he would die for our sins, Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. Did he die for our sins? Yes, yes, yes. Number six, he would be crucified, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Number seven, he would be crucified with criminals, Isaiah 53, verse 12. And number eight, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, verse 9. And the wise men in the east and the shepherds in Israel are studying these prophecies. They're looking for the Messiah. And when he turned up, they knew him. They knew him. And I could preach to you all day from these prophecies about Jesus Christ. And they should, as you study them, give you assurance on the reality of Jesus who came as a baby, lived as a man and died as a saviour. They should, they, they should give you assurance today. But for too long, in Adventism, we preach the prophecies and we miss the man Jesus. Amen? I've seen it over and over where people go to our evangelism programs, they listen to all the prophecies, they decide to follow God, make a stand for Jesus, get baptised, but they missed him. And this Christmas I want to challenge you with something. I want to challenge you as I close with a story. And I go back to Facebook because at college I had a friend. I'm going to call him, I'm going to call him John. That wasn't his name and I do that for his own privacy. We went to college together. He, he was a guy who never mixed all that much with the rest of the, the college guys. Uh, I saw him. I, I would talk to him. It would be wrong for me to say that I ever really went out of my way to really make him a good friend because I didn't, but he was there, he wasn't a bad fellow. Well, he leaves college, and like many of my college friends did, and he was studying to be a Bible teacher, like me. He leaves college. When he left college, and I don't know his story, but he somehow leaves the Lord, he leaves Adventism, and he ends up, John ends up bitter, bitter, bitter bitter he is angry with our church he is angry with the pastors and with the people of the church too many Adventists when they leave us end up like this he's an angry angry man I pick him up on Facebook in this in this uh, particular page on this particular page that one of my friends who also is an ex-Adventist began that really attacks Adventism and he, he he just brought me onto this page I didn't really ask for it at all And I picked this guy up and I remember him from college. And I picked him up because when I'd made a comment on something, he just attacked. Have you ever had this on Facebook, those of you on it? He went for my throat. And it was fierce. And and, and I I can't say I, I reacted all that well initially, but when I got over the shock of the language and the way he was talking to me and the way he was talking about the church, I started to see a guy that was really hurt and really bruised and really wounded. And then I thought about this Jesus that we're all looking at this Christmas, who came down for guys like John, who are bruised, hurt, and wounded. And I tried to start to reach out to him. And I'll tell you, when you're reaching out to someone like that, it's like banging your head against a closed door. You know what I mean? You've got to be pretty tough in the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, to share Jesus sometimes with people who are hostile, hostile, hostile. But I learned a lesson as a pastor in the last few years that some of those who are the most hostile against you are those who the Lord's working on the hardest. Amen? So if you're sharing Jesus and someone's hostile, don't give up. Use the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and don't continue to pound away if they don't want it. But don't give up. And I was... This guy comes to me just a week or two ago, and, and, and this is where I, I bring this Bible study to a climax. And he said, I don't believe in your God. He's a fake. And I don't believe this Jesus. And he used some expletives as he... Uh, <laughs> the language is hard to bear. But he used some expletives talking about this Jesus. But he said, if he exists, prove it to me. 
Get him to come and call me to follow him. He just said something very dangerous, amen? I said, all right. He said, you and your God have got until December the 31st. He said, I'll bet you he doesn't call me. I bet you he doesn't come because he doesn't exist. And you can hear the pain and the frustration as he shared this with me. So this is my Christmas gift to him this year. And I want you to find someone to give this Christmas gift to in your life. Until December 31, I'm going to pray for this Jesus, this great God, who came down and became a baby and lived a life and died, and then went up and is on the throne of heaven today as our Saviour. I'm going to pray that Jesus will call John this Christmas. And as I close now, I want you to think about your life. And who is it in your life that does not know Jesus? And perhaps like me, you can pray a prayer that he will touch them too. Amen? You want to do that? Well, I want you to bow your heads right now. I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think about it. I'm going to pray for John right now. You think of someone in your life that needs to be touched by this baby who became the Messiah. And you pray for them right now, amen? Right now. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray for the people we want this baby who grew into the Messiah. Let's pray for them who we want him to touch today, this Christmas. Let's pray. Father, it's Christmas time. We know you weren't born at this time, but we celebrate your birth and the wonder of it because of the miracle it's brought to our own lives. We thank you, Jesus, that you got down off the throne, the great Yahweh, that you came as you promised and that you lived and died for our sins as you promised you would. We thank you, God, that you're in heaven now interceding for us in the, in the sanctuary. And we give you honour for that this Sabbath. But Lord, each of us has people who don't know you. And this Christmas, God, we pray for them. Touch them with your Holy Spirit and call them so that they can experience what we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you keep praying for that person until December 31. True, we'll do that? Okay, let's ask our music team. We're going to sing one more beautiful uh, Christmas hymn. Angels, we have heard on high. Uh, this is perhaps one of the songs the shepherds would have sung. Let's all stand and sing this beautiful song.
That's a beautiful hymn, amen? So I'm going to close with a prayer, but I want to just tell you something and then ask you something and then we close. That's the first time in 26 years I have preached this Sabbath weekend before Christmas, amen? And do you know why? Because I always go on holidays last week. But this is a new church and I'm not going on holidays this year until a couple of weeks in February where I'm going to go back to... Um, well, not back to because I've never been there, but I'm going to go to Bali and Jakarta with Lizka. And uh, very excited about that. Um, no, no, I am very. But if you and me trying to sit, into a, sit in a plane seat, you'd understand where the excitement comes from. And I'm not going business class. Um, next week, we begin a four-part series on the Great Controversy. And we're going to talk next week about the signs of the times. Really, really serious stuff. Then we're going to talk about the second coming the following week. Then we're going to talk about the third coming. Did you know there's a third coming? And then on the fourth week to finish this series, we're going to talk about how you can make sure you're ready for it. It's an important summer series but this is why I tell you, and I don't tell you this for any other reason than it's the truth, and Lizzie and Andrew will back you up. We're tired, amen? <laughs> I'm tired. Are you tired at the end of the year? This is what I want you to do, because this is such an important series, and it'll go on to Channel 10. I want you, and I don't normally ask this to pray for me. Would you do that? For no other reason than I'm tired, and yet this is an important series, and we need to get through it and advance God and His cause, and pray for Andrew and the team, that the Lord will give us strength through this Christmas period. Amen? You'll do that? I appreciate that, and it warms my heart. I actually need the prayers. So let's close this service thanking God for Jesus. Remember Him as you go through these festives, that it's really about Him, and do your best to continue to pray for that person that you prayed for, that they too will find Jesus as you have. Let's close our eyes and, and close with benediction. Father in heaven, we thank you again for Jesus. And this Christmas as we celebrate, some with family, some alone, however we find ourselves, Lord, may you be with us. May you walk closely with us. May we experience your presence, we pray. And may we leave this season with hearts overflowing with joy for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stay for lunch. It is the last lunch until the last Sabbath in January. So that's a special one. Stay for lunch, amen. Happy Sabbath. Angels, we have